You know, in the NFL, you can see that a lot of times where they need a lineman and they'll go that way. I think that's a dangerous thing to do. Um, you're still, in a lot of ways, the draft is about asset value because what you might need immediately is not going to be the same when that kid's 21 and your your team might change. So I think a lot of times with drafts, you have to look at asset, look at it as an asset. And historically, I just think defensemen are like uh, a good pitchers. You know, you can't have enough of them. And if you've got, it still starts back there, and if you've got good defensemen, you're going to always be able to go to the marketplace and pick up the other pieces you need. That's historically the way, you know, I think it's it's always been. And, and I, you know, that's the way I've kind of approached it. And that's, you know, like I say, usually your draft is like layers. And you're, it's very hard when you're dealing 18-year-olds to get them in a definitive spot where it's one, two, three, four, five. You know, usually maybe you can do the top two or three or four, depending how deep it is. But when you get down to those layers, then you might trend towards a position that has more value in the marketplace as opposed to what your team needs right now. Because I think, like I said, that's a dangerous thing. Because very few 18 or 19 year olds are going to play right away anyway. And your needs could easily change within, you know, a three year span when that kid's ready. So it's it goes to who to. And now you're back to your familiar statement. You know, the best player and then the most valuable position. And I think that comes back to the old hockey argument. I mean, if you if you're starting a team and you can have the greatest defenseman in the world, say it's Bobby Orr, or the greatest center, it's Wayne Gretzky, or the greatest goaltender, who are you going to take to start your team? Well, most hockey people would take a goalie, and then the next thing they do is take a defenseman, and then you go up front. Now, again, you can get some argument on that, but traditionally it's the goalie makes five players better, the defenseman makes four better, and the center makes two better. But, uh, you know, you can argue, uh, you know, it makes good barroom discussion sometimes, but I think that's the way most hockey people would see it. So, so trade deadline, Dean, buyers, sellers, or bystanders? Well, one of the things that's very different than the last two years for me is, um, you know, I had a lot of veterans I was trying to move for picks, and we're the youngest team in the league, and quite frankly, I don't have any rentals even if I wanted to sell. Uh, I got a guy like Sean O'Donnell as the one of vet- veteran, and I just love what this guy brings to the team in terms of his leadership and uh, having been there, so... Um, I don't see um, us being the, the sellers we were in the last two two situations, and because, uh, like I said, I, I don't have a lot of those type players. Period. And um, but I'm curious to see if there's other deals though that don't necessarily aren't solely that rental player, but might be a time to grab a guy that not only fits now, but most importantly, fits next year and the year after. And I'm I'll be curious to see if some of those guys are out there, but. Then again, there's not a lot of sellers right now in the West. Everybody's in the playoffs. So, how do you decide who throws in the towel? Which is, you know, historically what happens when you, you know, you're at the deadline. There's not many guys like that. So, your friend of the schedule right about now, Dean, having had to play in Minnesota two nights ago and Philadelphia last night, <laughs> and then Detroit tomorrow. <laughs> 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 Nobody said this was going to be easy, right? No, you know what, though, Billy? I'll tell you. I, I said this to Clarky. I was talking to him last night. I said, you know what? I said, in some cases, when you're with a young team, I think they're more focused on the road. You know, now I don't like the fact we've got all of these road games coming up, and I think, you know, our owner's going to fix this now because, you know, L.A. has always had way too many home games on the front end, which I don't think is good for your team, and I don't think it's good for business. So we're going to get that fixed. But in terms of being on the road, I, I just think there's not a lot of real, like back when you played and you had to go into Boston Garden or Chicago Stadium or, you know, your den there, the Spectrum, I mean, those were intimidating places to play in. Mm-hmm. And there really isn't, how many buildings are really like that, you know, and, you know, and certainly so. I'm not so sure that that's as you know the same impact it was when you played. And then, like I say, with these young guys now, I, I think they go home. They, you know, when they're on the road, they eat with structure. They're with their teammates. You know, you go home. You got your marketing obligations, the community development. They don't always eat right. And then, you know, sometimes maybe they get a little full of themselves and they're at home and try and do things and impress people. And so. Other than the fact, I think it wears us out physically at this stage because we're on the road so much, and um, I'm not so sure it's as bad as it. Certainly not like it was when you played. 
It's never really that bad one way or the other, Dean. You know that. Hey, listen, thank you for joining us. Good luck down the stretch. You've done a tremendous job, and good luck with your young guys in the future. (laughs) Okay, thanks, guys. Take care, Dean. All right. right. That's Dean Lombardi, the GM of the L.A. Kings. He's done a fantastic job. He's a class act, and this L.A. Kings is a – this group is a team to watch. Uh, If not this year, then definitely next year. We're going to step out and come back.